welcome to the Political Philosophy Podcast. I'm Toby Buckle. So, I have just a few quick notes, a few quick housekeeping items before I get to today's show. Firstly, if this is alright with everyone, I'm going to switch the release date of these shows a little bit. So we'll still do one every week, and I'll still release them on weekends. But I'm thinking it would just be a little bit easier for me, fitting them around a full-time job and doing all of this, to release them on Sundays as opposed to Saturdays. So I have been releasing them on Saturdays. This one's coming out on a Sunday. I think the last one or two were out on Sundays. So if it's alright with everyone, I think they're going to come out on Sundays from now on. So I hope that's okay. Second point is, I want to just say I really, really, really value all of the incredible feedback and commentary, both critical and positive, that I've been getting on this show. Unfortunately, it is getting to the size where I'm getting so much of it that I can't respond to every message individually. I'm doing my best, I'm still replying to some, but realistically, if I'm getting a couple of dozen messages a day, which, not every day, but I have been getting that some days, I'm not going to be able to do a personalised response to each one, and I hope you can all understand that. I still am reading all of the comments, and I'm trying to reply to some, but I, I want to be real on two fronts. I want to please encourage you to send me direct messages or email. I really do value those, but I also just want to be realistic where it's getting to the point that I don't know that I'll be able to reply individually anymore, and um, I hope you'll all understand that. Final bit of housekeeping is I've been on a few other people's podcasts recently, so I did a video interview. This was great, by the way. I, I even worked out how to look at the camera halfway through it. Um, but I was on Jerb the Humanist's channel, and we talked about ideology and liberalism versus radicalism. And that was really fun, and I'm glad I did it. And I was also on a more informal, less academic podcast um, called Voices from the Underground, where we talked about superhero movies and smoking, and um, then eventually got into some questions of social justice, so that was quite fun. So I'll include the links to both of those in the show notes for this episode, if you want to check that out. And for this episode, this also follows on in the collaboration theme. So I did want to get this interview to you, and then after this I will get you, as promised, the conclusion to the Libertarianism series. That's still in the works, it's, it's, it's still coming. But for this episode, I had another collaboration. I had Erin Rabinowitz over from the Embrace the Void podcast. So I think many of you will be familiar with Embrace the Void. It's a very similar show and format to this one. It's a moral, political philosophy show that does some commentary and some interviews in a similar length and format to this one. I guess the difference would be that stylistically, they just absolutely outclass us. So they have a wonderful, dark, gothy sort of theme which, um, you know, I'm just going to read you, actually, um, just to, to, to set the, the mood, how um, they introduce themselves on their website. So um, if this doesn't motivate you to want to check out their show, I don't know what will. But, but this is how they describe the Embrace the Void podcast. And I quote here, because I, I could never write anything like this, but uh, quote, Welcome, friends to a podcast for a darker timeline. Maybe the darkest of all timelines. Definitely not one of the good timelines. Maybe it's always been a dark timeline, maybe the Hadron Collider screwed us over. Science may never know. What we do know is that we live in the void. The void. A place where a chittering mass of void crabs can infest a person's suit and win the presidency. The void. A place where we're just clever enough to know for sure that climate change is happening, but not quite clever enough to do anything about it. The void seems terrible and cruel, but it loves you in its own ironic way. End quote. So anyway, like I say, 
the Embrace the Void podcast is quite a similar variant of this one, but uh, a little classier and darker than we are. So anyway, I've been listening to that show, and um, I invited Aaron on, which he very graciously agreed to, and we had a great conversation about moral luck, and then we got on to, there'll be a bonus episode after this one, just on what is morality and how do we justify moral claims if we can at all. So in the, this will be a two-parter. This is the first part. In the first part, we discuss moral luck, and in the second part, we're just going to discuss is morality possible at all? And I think this was a really great conversation in that we agreed about enough that we had a common foundation and we weren't just talking past each other, but we disagreed about enough that we had some interesting and engaged back and forth. So, I really appreciated this, and I appreciated Aaron coming on, and yeah, I hope you enjoy it too. So yeah, without any further preamble, it is my absolute pleasure to bring you Aaron from the Embrace the Void podcast. I am joined today by Aaron Rabinowitz. Aaron, thanks so much for coming on. Thanks for having me. So, um, you are a fellow podcaster. Um, how did you get into this? Uh, I ended up with a commute um, by driving. So, I was living in Brooklyn at the time and uh, suddenly got a gig um, teaching at Rutgers and I was commuting about an hour, hour and 15 by car each way, three days a week or so. So I needed something to do and I wanted something that was more interesting than just listening to the same music over and over. So I, that's when I got into podcasting and quickly realized that it was a great medium for doing philosophy. And so got involved, and here I am. Yeah, now, weirdly, that's exactly the same for me. I work in New York City, and I live on Staten Island, so I just have this hour bus commute in oh, there you go. every day. And um, yeah, podcasts for me too. And, and um, I should, I want to add, I should add, um, yeah. it, it came about as a result of the, also at the same time, there was the 2016 election, and we all know how that went. And um, my really good friend, GW, from many years uh was like hey we should start some kind of podcast and it it all just kind of glommed together into this thing called embrace the void where it was about using philosophy to deal with all of the trauma that we were all currently facing and has you know expanded out from there to be various kinds of uh, philosophical educational material community organizing it's actually been a while for me since i sort of let my own personal views come in because Mm -hmm. like at the beginning i was just interviewing philosophers and you know we'd get into conversations and we would talk about political issues but less commonly would we talk about like politics politics and more recently i've been sort of more open in what i believe and some people really reacted badly to me being i know like liberal most of the time and it's like have you not been listening to anything i've been saying for 50 episodes yeah i mean you certainly have a clear liberal bias well with the the wealth of facts and whatnot yeah Um, i mean i don't know who said reality has a liberal bias but no i I think stephen colbert i'm pretty sure Yeah, I yeah, I mean, people do get really, really mad. But I think anyone who get, who talks about social justice warriors and gets really offended and ironically easily triggered by those sorts of claims, I think we've sort of lost most of them at this point. But we'll see. And it also, we'll see. It, it, you know, it breaks the spell of the illusion that like information is coming to people in in ideologically neutral kinds of ways. Right, that, like you know, it makes it forces them to re- remember that like everyone has a bias, and I think you know it's better to be upfront with your perspectives. You know, I'm a progressive liberal, and that has always been the case, and that influences my perspective on a lot of things, and will probably do so forever. I mean, I was going to say you guys are fairly lefty, right? 
Yeah, I'm like, you know, I am sympathetic to a lot of the democratic socialist kinds of um, overhauls that would be helpful for our system. I'm, you know, but I'm also like, I believe that markets and capitalism are a viable method of addressing a variety of needs that human beings have, just not all of the needs that human beings have. So some people would probably put me more towards the neoliberal camp, but uh, I, I, I've i always identified as a progressive. I think that the key principle here is that we as a society can improve things by bringing knowledge and caring together and enacting policy. Yeah. I sort of want to be that. I want to be in the centre mm-hmm. because a lot of people take real pride in like, oh, I'm a radical, I'm a radical, I'm so radical, and I just don't. I, I, I sort of... Just, just, I like to see my own views as common sense that I could explain to anybody. Um, but if I look at the positions I actually hold, there's no doubt that I'm well on the left end of the spectrum, as it's conventionally understood. Yeah, and I, I think you know, I, I don't have, I don't see the value in fetishizing either. You know, like I'm a centrist or I'm an extremist. The reality is, on some things, some people are going to accuse me of being an extremist, and on other things, I'm going to be accused of being a centrist. You know, if you ask me about gun control, I'm going to give you an answer that most liberals will not like. Um, but on the other hand, if you ask me about, um, you know, uh, redistribution of wealth, I'm going to give you an answer that the conservatives are very much not going to like. So. Yeah. And I think we're going to get back to redistribution of wealth because we're going to do moral luck, um, mm-hmm. which is a lot of this. A lot of this does come from, like, philosophical questions that in my head have been more or less answered that, if not tell you exactly what to believe politically, rule out certain opinions right out the gate. Um, yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll get back to that. We'll get back to that. Let's start with moral luck because I must admit – we, we were emailing back and forth, and you were like, you know, my, my hobby horse is moral luck. I sort of thought you meant something a bit different. So just to clarify, what what mm-hmm. does that term mean to you, moral luck? Sure. So moral luck is, to me, one of several it, – it's, it's one of the most interesting, to me, of a, of a variety of very deep ethical problems, real serious challenges that in the nature of ethics and the way it plays out in reality that are – that we are may not have any perfect solutions for that we may always be wrestling with in a sense. Um, the problem, what this refers to, is moral luck occurs in situations where an individual is held morally responsible for something that was beyond their control, uh, and that's bad because, in most people's view, it's it's pretty much universally, I think, believed that. Whether or not you should be held morally responsible for something hinges on whether or not you were on you you had control over it in a sense that there's an absurdity to holding someone responsible for something that is not under their control. Uh, and then what happens is uh, Thomas Nagel comes along in this very brilliant um, famous paper about moral luck and says, and it's luck all the way down. And there's no control of that luck all the way down. And so in a very robust, problematic kind of way, we have a major challenge to moral responsibility, along with a major challenge to, like you mentioned, free will and uh, a a robust sense of the self as an independent entity is seriously threatened by this view. So let's talk it down, because in the moral Mm -hmm. luck paper by Nagel, it starts with big picture stuff. So like... You know, the difference between murder and attempted murder in our criminal justice system can be, Mm -hmm. you know, I'm firing a sniper rifle and there's a gust of wind that blows it six inches off course, right? It's nothing I did. Not even no intentionality that I had. It's nothing I did. But that's the difference between five years and 25 years in prison, right? Right. So there's that. And, like, how would you justify that difference? That's the first level. But then there's even... You know, you can you can get to a down to a series of steps whereby even like being the type of person who would pull the trigger is in a right. sense just genes and upbringing and so on. But it gets the further down you get, the less intuitive it gets to most people. Right, exactly. So he divides moral luck into a couple of different categories, and he he basically, like you said, says you know we can start with this 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 one this version of moral luck that most people agree exists, but they also don't think is 
you know, the end of the story and, and like is a, is a knockdown problem for what we're talking about here. But then you can move down through these harder and harder levels of moral luck and eventually hit a point where it does raise this really substantial problem. Uh, resultant moral luck or consequential moral luck, right? The luck and how things turn out. Um, his classic example is the two individuals who run a stop sign and one of them has the bad luck of hitting a child who ran out into the street at that moment. Um, and and like those do present problems for us being consistent about what I was saying about the control condition, this idea that you can only be held responsible for, you should only be held responsible for what's under your control. But we, most people think um, that you can get out of that problem by, as he describes it, like a move inward where you move from consequences to discussing uh, the intention behind the action, essentially, which is sort of what you were describing. But even at that level, actually, Mm -hmm. um, what I want to note Okay, so here's my view. Uh, Is actually this control condition intuition, even at this quite high level, is one that, that, yes, if you state it in the abstract, everyone will nod along and say, you know, that's right. But actually, we ignore it all the time. Like, I think, um, Mm -hmm. so I'll give you one example. I think about a third of criminal law has no menace ray requirement at all. So a menace ray is just a guilty mind. There has to be some intentionality behind the act. So just by means of example, most age of consent laws don't have a menace ray requirement. If I sell alcohol, if I own a bar that sells alcohol to a minor... I am responsible for that, even if I was out of the country and I trained all of my staff correctly and I told them you have to do this. If they did it, I'm still liable for it. Likewise, Mm -hmm. if you have sex with someone who's underage, doesn't matter if you were legitimately deceived. There's no intentionality requirement to that law. And I think when you explain those cases to people, they just sort of nod along and go, yeah, I mean... I guess that actually sort of makes sense, right? Like, that doesn't violate our intuitions as much as, Mm -hmm. like, it would seem in the abstract. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, I mean, what I would say is I think one solution at that level of the moral luck problem, one way that you can maintain consistency, as it were, would be to say, we're not going to worry about intentions at all. We're just going to hold everyone who does this thing equally accountable even if they did it by accident and like that will that will seem weird in the cases where we're doing it to someone who clearly really really didn't mean to but the overall benefits of doing so maintaining that consistent principle will be good for society and so we can justify it in other kinds of terms while acknowledging that like it's going to be a little weird when we when we apply this principle to someone who it really, really shouldn't be applied to in this context. Yeah, but that does, like... I, I think there's sort of an answer to, like, this level, which just maps down, which is you can imagine um, the, the bar owner or... Um, well, let's, let's make it more visceral, right? Let's... There was... Um, you know, someone who sleeps with uh, a 14-year-old girl, and it's like, oh, but she told me she was 18, I even saw a fake ID, da 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 There's a level where I think you would just look that person in the eye and say, we are still holding you morally accountable for this. Like, I think most people would be comfortable with that. And then, and if they say, but like, I wasn't ultimately, there was no intentionality on my part. The answer is, we just view this act as wrong. And, like, there's all sorts of good consequentialist reasons why it's wrong overall, and we're just going to punish it where it occurs. And more than that, like, just the fact that the, the act has happened is sort of so morally outrageous to us that we are just going to punish it. And then that maps down to the, like, but I was just born a person with the genetics that makes me a psychopath. We're still going to hold you accountable. Does that make sense? Yeah, and I think, I mean, I think that you you can, on the moral luck of you, ultimately come up with good good reasons for continuing to act as if people are morally responsible. But I think if we're being honest that, like, we can't solve the whole problem that way because there are uh, remainder intuitions that stick around. So, for example, if 
you you know, if you sleep with the 14 year old and it's your first time doing something like this and you've never done anything like that before and, and you say, I, I didn't intend to do this. We will, in theory, I think, look at you a little differently than someone who repeatedly does that thing, for example, or someone who has a compulsion to sleep with 14 year olds. So I think there are ways in which even doing that simplified model is going to get you sort of the wrong results. And you may be okay with those results in those contexts, but I don't, I don't think that, uh, I think that you end up seeing things differently and you end up treating individuals differently, even while you are punishing them, for example. Yeah. And that's true. And you can nuance it like Mm -hmm. that. Um, I'm just pointing out that like the, the, I'm not saying that, that, that like that, that is something you can consistently map across. I'm just saying even in the big level cases, our intuitions and how we actually act as a matter of criminal law aren't mm. as straightforward as simply an application of the control condition. I, I agree. And I think the reason it doesn't map down to the lower levels is not because it isn't practical for it to map down to like the constitutive moral luck level, but because most individuals will balk if you tell them that they first have to accept that the problem of moral luck goes all the way down and then still build an ethical system in spite of that. So that's the hump that I think people have trouble getting over. And I think once they get over it, they actually build a better ethical system on the other side. Right. Okay, so let's let's go through that hump then. Okay. Because this is just, at this point, so intuitive to me that you can risk forgetting how non-intuitive it is to everyone else. Sure. Right? In that... Because you're also a liberal. <laughs> Right, and we can we can get into that. I, I I think it might be a bit more complicated than than it mapping to a left right divide. But but let's just get through the hump first. So the hump sure. is right. We understand that the, the let, let's take the the running the stop sign case. We understand mm-hmm. that that's just luck, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but making the conscious choice to run a stop sign that's mm-hmm. not luck surely, right? And what would we do as a society? How would, you know, surely there must be some sense of the agent running around in someone's head that that we can pin all of this to. Um, Like, okay, as a liberal, I can say, you know, yes, people are poor. Yes, people, there's racism and disadvantage. But people still make a choice to work hard or people still make a choice to behave badly, even if, like the ability to make those choices well is not, you don't have equal opportunity in that. The, this, the choices are still there at the heart of it somewhere, right? Right. So yes, that I think is the the current state of play for a lot of folks intuitively. So what, I, what I, the way I'd put it is, you're willing to buy into the idea of circumstantial moral luck. So not only are you okay with luck of consequences, you're willing to say, I get the idea that like systemic poverty leads to increased crime. I get like, I get the way that these kind of circumstantial effects, you know, I, if I were born, I think we can all, we all have to address the fact that if you were born in 1930s Germany, the odds of you being a Nazi rather than a resistance fighter are high. Like most human beings end up on the side of the status quo, on the side of the oppressor in these sort of, in these sort of ways that, and even if you wouldn't like your life now, right, you can benefit from a kind of luck of never having to face a question like that. I mean, I mean, you know, we're in, given our current state in this country, maybe you will have to face that question at some point in the future. But at present, you have not had to, like, face the level of circumstantial moral challenge that someone in 1930s Germany had to face. Um, but like you said, a lot of individuals, including, I think, some liberals, will struggle with going the final step to constitutive moral luck. The idea that um, not just your circumstances, but, you know, we, we think of the individual who, like, pulls themselves up out of poverty or out of an abusive situation and is still a moral person. And we think, well, they clearly had some kind of character that allowed them to overcome that adversity and still flourish as an individual. 
But if we're honest, whether or not they had that kind of character was also not under their control. There's no sense in which the person that you grew up to be, you you can always trace everything about you back to factors beyond your control, it seems like. But I remember X circumstance in which all of the incentives were for me to do a particular thing. Um, I was in a job where I was asked to do something unethical, and um, all of my social conditioning was to do it. My economic incentives were to do it, um, and I still chose not to, even though I knew it wouldn't benefit me in any way. And if there's not some point there at which I can hang my ego on and place some sort of agency there for which I can be rewarded or blamed, then what the fuck does anything mean? Okay, good. Let's put a pin in the ego part because that is really important and part of the reason – Maybe I shouldn't have said that because that's what I think it comes down to. But well, no, I, anyway, no yeah. I mean I think it's absolutely 100 percent important that part of the reason people draw the line at constitutive moral luck is they want to be – they want to set the, the egoic sense of praise and, and responsibility for the good things that they've done. But first I want to drill down on your exper- your thought experiment for a second here, right? So – in this hypothetical where you did this thing, even though all the factors were working against you, did you ha- did you do it because of some reason? Did you have a reason for why you did it? Sure. Um, a, a, an innate sense of justice, let's say. My, my, the, the better angels of my nature okay. intervened. Did you, did you choose to have better angels of your nature? Did you choose to have that strong, innate sense of justice? I chose to act on that moral intuition. In what sense did you choose to act on it? You were driven by that reason instead of the other reasons, correct? Yes, I I had an instinct for my financial gain, I had an instinct for my um, uh, uh, comfort, and I had an instinct to do the right thing. Okay, and the right thing won out because that factor was stronger than all the other factors together right that 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 factor run one out because i chose it as a discrete ego object sitting behind my eyes and weighing <laughs> up the options of the universe me jumped in and intervened in the chain of causality and said that one all okay. of all of society and nature and all this deterministic bullshit that presented me the options but i chose the option you weren't determined to choose the option. Exactly. So what did you choose it based on if it wasn't determined by anything? Was it arbitrary? On the basis of... On the basis of... And that's the problem, right? There's not a brilliant answer to that question. Nope, there is no brilliant answer. <laughs> that's a the hard question. I mean, so this this is my... I'll, let, me, let me formalize this, right? This is my infinite regress problem for, for moral luck, which is for any action, I think you can ask, you either did it for a reason or you didn't do it for a reason. If you didn't do it for a reason, then it was arbitrary. If you did it for a reason, we can trace the efficacy of that reason and its origination in yourself back to your personal history in some way, things beyond your control. Maybe you had parents who happened to teach you about the importance of justice and habituated you to make the right choice. Or maybe you had the opposite, and because your parents were terrible, you highly valued being a better person than they were. But whatever it is that made that thing a part of you and not a part of someone else was not a choice that you made at the age of three or seven or whatever. Like, that doesn't make any sense. What if it's truly spontaneous, though? I have these options before me, and um, it, mm-hmm. it, it just is some neurons firing in my brain, and I go, that one. But even then, it's the neurons. It, it, you know, I, I think a lot of... So, okay, I'm just getting to my own views here. I think a lot of people want to like bring the idea of chance, or if you want to get really dorky, like quantum indeterminacy or something. Well, uh, yeah, they sure do. But let's just say it's chance, then. That's still th- 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 Then there's still no place for the ego to jump into the co- chain of causality. Like It might not right. be determined in that if you rewinded the universe back to the beginning and press play again, you might get something different. But if that difference is based on chance or indeterminacy, there's still no room for the soul or the ego to be hiding. Yeah. The way I like to put it is 
with free will, you can either have freedom or you can have a will, but you can't have both. If it's in an, it's in any robust sense of will, then it's a determined thing in a kind. And, you know, it, um, Nagel puts it right. There's something inconsistent about our ethical view and recognizing that human beings are objects and actions are just events. But human beings really are just objects and actions are just events. Right. But then the next category of objection then becomes, mm -hmm. but that can't be right. Because without agency, there is no morality. Right. So now, now you know, and that's like, I'm fine with that. If I can get people to buy into the existence of constitutive moral luck, I'm already happy. Anything that happens after that point is icing on the cake for me one way or the other. Because I, I believe that that is the important switch that needs to be thrown in people's minds. Because once they start looking for constitutive moral luck, they will see it everywhere and it will change the way they treat other human beings. And like, you know, for me, it's all about how this ends up on the ground between human beings. So but sure, let's talk about your question, right? Go ahead. But so, so there's an analogous argument of like, um, but if you don't believe in God, won't people just run around raping and murdering each other, right? right. Now, so, yeah. You, you can sort of point out that empirically that doesn't seem to be the case, but that seems to miss... I'm actually, like, somewhat baffled here, even to construct a devil's, devil's advocate argument, because I actually don't really get what this argument is trying to do, because even just accepting the 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 causal link that like without bullshit we won't be good even stipulating that it seems mm -hmm. odd to reason backwards from this 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 set of outcomes or beliefs is desirable therefore x is true that just seems uh, epistemologically backwards to me does that make sense yeah absolutely so like the question of psychologically Right. Rather than theoretically, can we sustain ethics on this view is you're right, exactly like the question of can an atheist still be still act morally. And I think in both cases, the answer is yes. And the reason is they have a bunch of good reasons for acting morally, even if they didn't choose those reasons, you know, but even if there weren't reasons right let's let's let you know we'll get on to the side of can we reinflate the balloon of ethics and i think we both mm -hmm. think that we can but then let's say our arguments don't work there it doesn't mean that this argument backwards from morality makes any sense right right it, it, it's like saying i'm gonna believe in god because if i don't i'm gonna start murdering people like that's not the way that belief formation does or should work most of the time, in my opinion. Like, you're asserting what you've been asked to prove. If you say, why are we moral? And you say, well, I'm assuming agency is real, and because of agency, we should be moral. And then you say, mm -hmm. well, agency isn't really real in a fundamental sense. They say, oh, you've got to, you've got to have agency, otherwise you couldn't have morality. That, that's just an infinitely expanding tautology. Right. And I mean, like you said, it's empirically, verifiably false. I teach this paper multiple times a semester every semester and i've yet to have a student knock wood go on a killing spree as a result because again they have very good reasons not to that's why we, that's what we built society for <laughs> like so I, I think the the harder problem is the theoretical side can we can we maintain a consistent theoretical justification for our behaviors, or are we essentially committing ourselves to a kind of hypocrisy in continuing to act the way we – or continuing to treat ethics like it's real when we've already said that free will isn't? Well, well there, are, there, are, there are ways in which ethics isn't real, right? Like, the, I, I think – the balloon reinflates, but there's some parts of it that won't. And there's, to use the religion analogy again, um, there's this um, uh, fiat justentia ruat salem, um, let, let justice be done or the heavens fall, the idea being it is better that you avoid even the tiniest, most venal sin than that the entire world is destroyed, right? You'll mm -hmm. never get back to that from, like, a pure ground-up morality. You'll only get that with God. And... The idea that of, of like some of the extreme 
libertarian justifications Absolutely. of our society. Um, you'll never get back to that from pure consequentialism or justice ethics. So, or, sorry, virtue ethics. Um, so there is a sense in which, like, I'm willing to bite the bullet there and say, yes, in the very specific sense you mean it, where there is an extra human origin to the social order, an extra human constraints, supernatural constraints, or just this spooky free will stuff binding our actions. Yeah, in a certain sense, that just isn't real. I mean, as a moral realist, I think there are, they're not supernatural, but there are objective moral truths that um, constrain us in a sense, and that, or that ought to constrain us, whether or not they effectively do psychologically is a separate question. But, and I think we can say that those objective moral truths remain true, even if we discover that human beings don't have free will and aren't robust persons in the sense that this view suggests. And that um, you're right that certain foundations, certain objective ethical truths aren't going to survive in the sense that, like, you know, libertarian views about egoistic views or other ones, I think, are ones that are just like the, the Randian objectivist model is just not going to come back on this view, uh, which, again, is why I, I lean towards the idea that, like, whether or not you adopt this view, if you do adopt this view, it will pull you left in a sense that um, even even conservatism, I think, has a hard time maintaining its teeth in the face of this problem. And it's why I find that a lot of folks want to, are, are very aghast at the idea of talking about luck on this level. Yeah, I mean, conservatism is f empirically false in a way that other ideologies aren't. But let me just try and explain the intuition I was trying to cash out there. Yeah. Um, is that using the analogy again of religion, Religion wants to say there's the natural and the supernatural. And there are some aspects of what religion wants to claim about morality and meaning and so on that replicate in the natural, that you don't need the supernatural for, but the supernatural isn't real. And by analogy, there's certain, like, hard ought claims I think mm -hmm. in a certain sense, the idea that human rights are self-justifying and self-sustaining and have no found, that, ex that would exist independently even if people weren't there, mm -hmm. that actually is a sort of like, supernatural's the wrong word, but like maybe just this strong metaphysical claim that doesn't re-exist. You can, you can justify certain rules of behaviour, call them human rights, to appeals to things like human happiness and well-being and flourishing. But in a certain sense, human rights aren't real in the same way as God isn't real. Well, so yeah, this, this is the like the fight, as I understand it, between Locke and Hobbes about natural rights versus not natural rights. Hobbes takes the view that you do as a materialist that he says, as far as I can tell from reading him, um, you know, that like there is no justice before society. There is a war of all against all. And in war, there are no, you know, objective moral truths about what you ought to do or ought not to do. Any immoral actions are part of um, proper behavior within that war of all against all. And it's only when society comes together and makes up this idea of property rights and defends it with a sword that anything like an actual property right exists. Whereas other folks will claim, you know, in prior to society, you have, I hate the word natural. I despise the word natural, but what we, all, term, we all do. Right. Yeah. As well. We should, right. You have, objective rights that exist prior to society. And that's why a society that denies you, if you're gay, the right to marry is objectively doing something wrong. It's objectively depriving you of a right that, you, that, that it, it can't bestow upon you in some way. So there's, I, I think there's a bit of daylight that I'd want to get between the word objective and what I'm, and, and the way I'm talking about extra human. I, I think you can talk about morality objectively in a way that you can do without invoking the extra human, right? Um, so let's take the Locke Hobbes thing. I'm not going to go for a full brutal war of all against all. But in other words, mm. is morality something that's discovered or constructed? It's, exactly. It, it, it's got to be constructed because discovered just doesn't make any fucking sense. And if you think it does, let's 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 go to that. Yeah, I have the exact opposite intuition. So, 
Um, but but we can talk objectively about. So by analogy, money isn't real. It's not. There's no value other than our agreeing to it. But you can have objective facts about what the interest rate is. That is as hard an objective fact as you're ever going to get in the social sciences. Um, and what what makes morality objective is the fact that conscious experience is a fact. I, it, it is epistemologically knowable that we have conscious experience, and you can build outwards from that to ask, you know, what ultimately maximizes a set of desirability concepts is an objective thing, ultimately, right? And claims about it are, in theory at least, empirically falsifiable even if we might never get there in practice. Um, and so you can talk objectively about morality, um, but, but it's not, there's no, there's nothing that makes the gold worthwhile other than that we all agree it's worthwhile. Does, that, that was a little rambling, but that, that's my no. sort of starting point there. I totally get what you're saying. This is the Euthyphro dilemma, right? Is it good because we say it's good, or do we say it's good because it really is good? Right. Right. And, I, and you're taking the view of it's good because we say it's good, it seems like, um, ultimately, which I think I think goes the wrong way in the dilemma. Let, let, let me put it more clearly. Let me put it more clearly. We can make objective claims about conscious experience. Those claims mm-hmm. are epistemologically falsifiable. Mm-hmm. But those claims wouldn't exist and couldn't be discussed meaningfully if there were no conscious experience. If conscious experience went away, so would those claims. So th- that's an interesting question, right? If you had a universe with no conscious entities in it, would there still be ethical truths in that universe is one way I think that this this yes. question sometimes arises, right? And I think... I think the answer is actually still yes. They would just apply to a null set of entities. So let me let me give you for example, okay. right? Uh, there, there there would be an objective ethical truth that would say, were there conscious entities that experience pleasure and pain in this universe? One ought not all things considered, or one ought not at least all things else being equal to produce more pain and less pleasure for those entities, right? Uh, another one would be. You know, all things being equal, if there were entities in this world that could flourish, one ought to promote their flourishing. What is that true in virtue of? It's true in virtue of, I would say, the nature of those entities as beings that have mental states that have and I bite the bullet here and say they have to be doneness and to be avoidedness built into them and in virtue of those features like pain and pleasure and the ability to flourish versus not certain moral truths are true about them objectively so and, and objectively here I mean independent of anyone's beliefs about those moral claims there's a question about what objectivity here means, right? Which does objectivity mean agent independence or like I'm gonna say this one, but like agent intradependence, right? Like does objectivity mean it's true even if there's not an agent? Or does it mean that like if we're having a discussion, there's ultimately nothing we can say to one another, it's just like, do you like pink or do I like green? Right? Um, right. Okay, that was. But like, it's. But you, you did just say you, you are making a move which is pulling itself up by its bootstraps. There, in terms of you, you built the. What was the phrasing you used? To be doneness and to be avoidedness. That's that's Mackey's reductio ad absurdum of moral realism. I'm I'm taking it back. But. If you start with an idea of morality and objectivity, for that matter, as ultimately constrained by and starting within the domain of conscious experience, then you don't need to make that pull yourself up by the bootstraps move. Your foundation is, I think, therefore I am. Now... A lot else might be wrong outside of that, but I'm, you know, starting with with Descartes this time, just like, 
I, a conscious experience exists. That is my premise. Yeah, and, and and look, I I there's an interesting question I think about whether you can have ethics about things other than conscious entities and I think there are some good arguments to say that there are impersonal ethical truths, there are agent independent truths. There there's some good arguments about the moral significance of wholes in a sense, not individuals. So that's one way that you can go in this kind of debate, but I I mean I do think that a lot of ethics as we understand it is necessarily tied to the nature of conscious entities, but that's different from saying it's subjective, from saying that it is belief dependent. So saying that morality is in large part about entities that have consciousness is not the same thing as claiming that if those entities got together and voted on a particular ethical claim, that that would actually change the ethical truths in any kind of way. Right, no, and that's not what I'm claiming. So right, okay. to be clear, a majority of people can be wrong about morality, right? Right. Um, here's, here's my, my even, even if a hundred percent of people believed something, they could be wrong, not just a majority, an absolute unity. Yes. I can imagine a society in which, well, no, you don't even have to imagine, right? Like there are past societies where everybody believed that you went to an afterlife that didn't exist. Mm -hmm. Everyone was just objectively wrong about an aspect of conscious experience, namely that it survives the death of the body, right? Right. Um, what I'm saying is, we have conscious experience... Here's my two premises that you have to grant me to get morality off the ground. Uh -huh. We have conscious experience, and there are different types or aspects or experiences within... Experience is another one of these fucking words, like nature. But there are different experiences within consciousness. And we can meaningfully talk about differences between conscious experiences, right? Now, when you start separating them out, you'll say, well, this one's pain, this one's pleasure, this one's flourishing. In other words, you'll apply human language to it, and that'll immediately become very messy and imprecise because those words are poorly defined or whatever. I, I like Phillips Pettit's version of just a set of desirability concepts, right? So we can apply a set of desirability concepts to conscious experience. And okay, actually, I guess you have to grant me one more, which is that you have conscious experience as well. I'm not a solipsist, right? Mm -hmm. But then we can make claims objectively comparing our conscious experience through the medium of language. Um, and we can be right or wrong about those. Um, now, that, that doesn't... We could both be wrong about them, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we could both claim we're going to go to an afterlife, right? Or right. we could both claim whatever, but there's nothing outside of both of our conscious experiences existing in which we can appeal to make them right or wrong. Um, so that last part sounded a little bit more like you were getting into, like, how do we have access to the moral truth and what is our evidence for it? Can we really show that something is objectively better or worse beyond our intuitions about whether it's objectively better or worse. And I think that is a really hard question. Um, but I, I do think that, how would I put this? I, I think that you can do a mix of, well, so let me, let me, let me say this before I, before I move on to anything else. I, I think that you're, I largely agree with you that the way that value gets into the universe is by there being conscious entities in the universe in a sense i would just the the issue that i i push back on is that in the modern materialist like pre-postmodern like early modern materialist view um as i think you've talked about some on your show the moral stuff gets pushed into the anti-realist camp because it's not quantifiable and verifiable in the ways that the other stuff is. And so there's this long period where it's viewed as not being part of the fabric of the universe, partly because consciousness is not viewed as being part of the fabric of the universe on that view. And so I think when you let one back in, you have to let the other back in. 
I just want to be very clear and say, I think that that's different than saying there are no moral truths until society comes along and constructs them. I, I really do think that society comes along and discovers them in the same way that society comes along and discovers psychological truths. Yes, yes, yes. Right. Like that. That's so like. Yeah, okay, and we can argue about, like, I think that what that might come down to is just us using discover versus construct in a slightly different way. Because there's an account you could give where you say psychological truths are constructed, right? Because we observe features of our own consciousness in ourselves and in others and sort of build out on that basis, right? And you could be wrong about that, and everybody could be wrong about that. Right. Um, I agree. And you could call that a process of um, discovery, but because I think you know consciousness exists within the empiric in the within the sort of naturalistic empirical universe, right? Um, so you could be wrong about that. You could all be wrong about that, and you could say that's a process of discovery, or you could say. Um, it's a process of construction, but whatever you call it, you wouldn't get either of those processes without conscious minds. Yeah, and I mean, again, I'm. I want to say that I'm. I remain agnostic on can you have ethics without conscious minds. I think there are some interesting arguments being made there, and I haven't made up my mind one way or the other. I do think that the majority of what we're doing when we're doing our ethics is related to our conscious minds. So. You know, I, I buy yeah. that. Um, and I don't fucking know. Like, I'm not a philosopher. I just have philosophers on and bicker with them about meta-ethics. Um, and something else that's, I mean, I'm throwing here that's funny since you brought up con constructed personality is I'm much more bullish on anti-realism with regard to the self than I am with regard to moral claims. So I, I think mean, you're a lot more constructed than your morality in a sense. Yeah, well, I mean, I I just like... I'll quote Philip Pettit here. It offends parsimony, right? We have one basis for morality, which is sort of we know we all exist, right? Um, like, why do you need to bring anything else in when you've already got a basis that you know is real? Why are we still sort of faffing around with something that we really don't know is real? Does that make sense? Yeah, I just don't think that I'm bringing anything else in any more than someone does when they claim the laws of physics exist, right? The, I'm not I'm not creating another entity like a platonic moral truth that exists out there in a physical form or something. Right. Moral truths are just accurate descriptions of the world. They're not entities. Right. So I don't think Occam's razor applies here. I don't have a great response to that. <laughs> or to put it in Einstein's terms, right? Simplify as much as possible and then no more. And I don't I don't think that you can remove I think if you remove robust moral realism from the picture, you get a bunch of problems of subjectivism that you're not facing because I think in your your view is really a kind of it has a moral realist foundation, even though you think a lot of where we go from there is constructed societally, which yeah. I agree with. No, I mean, all I'm trying to say is what is real is real, and what we have good reason to believe in is what we have good reason to believe in. And that's mm -hmm. it. And let's get back into it this way, right? Mm -hmm. Is that sort of informs my critique of a lot of the policies that mm -hmm. that follow from a, a, you know a strong sense of agency or a strong sense of of whatever is um if if you're saying oh but you know if if we don't have this strong sense of agency we can't hold people responsible and like i'm just saying what do we have reason to believe in and i don't think we have reason to believe in a strong sense of agency or a strong sense of um desert or retribution or any of that stuff and yeah. if, if if you just sort of say, but but this or that consequence, I'm saying, what can we describe about the world honestly and accurately? That's it. I, I mean, I, I agree. And I think, so what I think exists, what, what persists here is the virtue ethic kind of view of the habituated self. If there is anything robust that is the you that persists 
through time. It's an entity that has been built up and it, it's not under your control in this moral luck sense. But so, so here, let me put it in the Buddhist terms, right? Um, there in the ultimate sense, there is no self in the conventional sense. There absolutely is a self. It's the combination of all the factors that are making up you right now. And that entity does still have causal efficacy in the world. And to deny that that, that entity exists, or to deny that it has interests in a sense is uh, as much a fallacy, I think, or a mistake as um, denying all the other stuff we've talked about so far. And and so, I mean, this is the way that these hard problems end up, in my opinion. There's no, we go this way or that way. It's, we have these two truths that are in tension, and they are not easily or maybe even ever resolvable, and our life is spent trying to figure out how to balance those two levels of truth. Thank you for listening to the Political Philosophy Podcast. Next week will be part two of this conversation where we just fully nerd out on what is morality and is it possible to talk about morality objectively. After that, I'll do the conclusion to my libertarianism series, and then, who knows, I've got a bunch of great suggestions for guests to reach out to, which I'm in the process of doing, so please do keep sending me those. I might also do an audience question and answer at some point. As always, if you want to support the show, there's a bunch of great ways that you can do that. Sharing these episodes always helps. All of the growth we've seen on this show have been purely organic, just people sharing episodes on their own Facebook, Twitter, social media, forwarding them to friends, stuff like that. And if you're able to sponsor on a more monetary level, we've been recommending a donation of $2 per episode on Patreon. So the way I've been putting that is if the episode you just listened to was as valuable or as um, distasteful to you as a cup of coffee, consider sponsoring it on a similar basis. What is an item of equivalent worth to you, to this podcast? And consider chipping that in. If you don't have that money to hand, that's completely fine. Feel free to enjoy them for free. That is the point of this podcast. But if you would like to help, and you are able to, making it possible to go out for free and without any advertisements to people, then know that that support is much appreciated. So a big, big thank you to anyone who does either of those two things, people who share or people who sponsor the podcast financially, or indeed people who do both. You're making it possible for me to do this. So genuinely, thank you. I'm really, really grateful for you doing that. I really am. That's it for this week. I hope you'll return next for the second part with Erin from Embrace the Void. And as always, thank you for listening. <laughs>